about what we can do differently, what we can do right to really actually fix the problems that our democracy has faced and that is facing perhaps even more so now during the pandemic. So this event is, or I won't belabor uh, given the that you don't have wine and snacks, which we usually provide uh, much by way of organizational announcements, simply to tell you that in addition to the Institute for Public Knowledge and the Gov Lab at, at NYU, um, we also have a variety of organizations that have helped to sponsor this. Uh, the Bradamus Center uh, at NYU has helped to support this and some of our other efforts on uh, reimagining Congress and crowd law. Uh, so that work has also been supported by the Democracy Fund that supports many of the people who are on this call with us, and we thank them for their support. Um, but also all of your organizations, Laura Lai, who comes from the Beck Center at Georgetown, uh, Daniel Schumann, who comes from Demand Progress, Marcy Harris of Popbox, and uh, Dr. Brian Baird from uh, Democracy, Vo Democracy Fund Voice. Uh, all of their organizations have helped to put on this event and to organize it. And I thank them for their time and their, in joining us today. A couple of quick logistical announcements. Uh, we have kept open the chat so that you can uh, talk to one another and keep the discussion going alongside the discussion that we're having with our panel. But if you would like to ask a question directly of the panel, I would ask that you please click the Q&A button on the bottom and type in your question. We will use that simply for purposes of kind of moderating and ordering the questions, but then uh, time permitting, what I hope to do is to call on people to have you ask your questions and participate directly in the discussion by unmuting yourself. But please keep the questions in the Q&A. Also, you'll notice the closed captioning button on the bottom. If you turn that on, it will provide you, if you click that, it will provide you with real-time captioning of the discussion uh, um, for anybody who finds that helpful and useful. Um, if you have any further technical questions, there are two people on here labeled host and co-host, Sam and Ani. So you can chat with them directly using the drop-down menu on the right. Just send them a direct message if you have any question or are unclear about how to use anything. And for those people who want to tweet about the event, we welcome you to do so. Uh, a lot of people in this community around this discussion tend to use the hashtag continuity of Congress. That's a lot of your 140 characters. So you can also just tweet at uh, or share it with us by tweeting to the handle the GovLab or NYU underscore IPK. And last thing I'll just say to our panelists is we don't know where everybody hails from. Uh, they may hail from all over the world, but they're not necessarily all from the Beltway. So I, I would just ask you to please define any jargon and avoid any inside the beltway jargon without explanation. Um, I'm I, hopefully not everybody on the call is a wonk, uh, uh, but there are a lot of people interested in uh, what's going on in Washington right now. And so I would just ask that you, uh, that you clarify any terms. Okay, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and dive in. We have lots of people here, some of whom may have heard about the fact that today the House Rules Committee Democrats introduced a resolution, resolution 965, that would provide for some remote deliberations for House committees and on the floor for the first time. And you'll hear from the panelists who will tell you more about what that resolution contains. I don't wanna steal their thunder, but that is going to be uh, likely voted on Friday, which I think is two days from now. Uh, it's hard to remember the day of the week, but together with discussion around the HEROES Act, they will actually, or uh, vote on the HEROES Act, um, that will that resolution will actually be considered and that will actually be a major potentially shift in the way Congress has been thinking about its response to the pandemic. Many of you may know that for more than five weeks going on six now COVID-19 crisis has all but closed Congress, a longer absence than Congress faced even in response to the 1918 Spanish flu. On May 4th, the Senate did reconvene for the first time since March, but the House is technically still not reconvened. And it's no wonder when you think about the fact that the average age of a senator is 63, the average age of a member of the House is 58. There are 17 construction workers in the Cannon House office building and 12 Capitol Police officers who at last count have coronavirus. And so members of Congress are at a particular risk from COVID-19. So while the rest of the world is going on Zoom and on WebEx and having quarantinis on their Google Hangouts, 
Members of Congress cannot hold virtual sessions. They can't hold official hearings. They can't vote remotely. House rules say that members have to be present on the floor in order to vote. So now there is a proposal that would allow for, as we'll hear about, the concept of proxy voting. And there are efforts to investigate new uses of online mechanisms. But there really is no good answer to how Congress should respond to coronavirus. Members cannot easily travel to Washington. And if they don't, however, the business of government all but stops. It doesn't keep going. And yet to move online, to start having Congress like we're having this discussion now would be a major shift, a major break from tradition, and one that some say would further erode an already highly eroded civility and lack of deliberation in the current culture of Congress. So I wanna to turn to our fabulous panel here to reflect on what's going on with uh, these questions of Congress during the pandemic and to really reflect in the context of our larger topic of the future of democracy, not only to talk to us about what's happening here and now, but what really what this means for the future of Congress and of democracy more broadly. And let me start with you, Brian, Dr. Brian Baird, former member of the House of Representatives. Why is it actually necessary for Congress to meet at all during this crisis? Things seem to be getting done. Heroes is going to get passed. We've had legislation that gone through what really is the essence of this crisis? Well, the essence is that you, we live in a republic and the republic means that you have someone on representing your interests on your behalf in the Congress. And of course the framers wrote article one to describe the legislative branch invested all legislative authority in the Congress, not in the executive and not in the judiciary. And so we have first and foremost, immediately this enormous crisis of the, of the pandemic, which is, uh, re requiring Congress already to spend trillions of dollars. More money has been appropriated and spent in a shorter period of time, I believe, than at any point in, in the nation's history. And on top of that, we have all the other regular business of Congress. We've got authorization bills. We've got the whole package of appropriations bills. We've got a host of things that need to be done. Most of that is not getting done in the way it's supposed to be. Even the appropriations had very little input, the, the emergency appropriations from the average member of Congress. There's virtually no oversight of that being allowed by the White House or imposed by the House and Senate. And uh, if the framers wanted to just vest everything in an executive branch or one or two people, they would have done so. But we are now effectively frozen because of uh, a reluctance and, and a, a, an unwillingness to meet remotely, just as we are in fact meeting remotely right now. Laura Lai, let me bring you into this conversation. Uh, normally you're from the Beck Center at Georgetown University, but now you're joining us from rural New Mexico, as everyone can see. I would imagine you are very sympathetic to those legislators who say it's difficult and a hard time getting to Washington right now. Uh, does Congress really need to go online? What do you agree with Brian? And what are you uh, observing and what are you hearing from others? Oh yeah, I mean, Congress not only needs to get online now, it needed to get online a long time ago. Um, I'm, I'm calling in from the cab of a pickup truck in rural San Juan County. Those of you who read the New York Times might have seen the, the story about Farmington, New Mexico in the headlines yesterday. That's actually where I am. And it talked about it as being in a death spiral, which is going to be made worse <laughs> by the pandemic. I, I have to think that's a little bit of an overstatement given that I grew up here and it's beloved to me. Um, but yes, it is, it is suffering and, and it is the, uh, the much more uh, uh, industrialized part of this county. The real tragedy right now is happening on the Navajo Nation, which is about 26 miles in that direction outside of a city called Shiprock, New Mexico. I wrote to uh, the local member of Congress the other day and got an out of office message that said, I'm sorry, but we can't get online. I'm sitting here talking to you on a hotspot, which I'm lucky enough to get. And my backup is a commandeered Nest camera um, Wi-Fi signal because it, um, this Wi-Fi out here in this area is, is these complacent monopolist little local Wi-Fi companies. And it takes three hours to watch an episode of Seinfeld. So you can imagine that it can't get much worse in the rural areas of the United States. 
On top of that, if you look at just the functioning of Congress before this pandemic hit, I'll think things we were all working on, the fact that it's at uh, 1975 levels of staffing capacity and it's maybe doing half of its deliberative process, meaning the hearings, I feel like this moment that we're in right now is a possible Article I renaissance. We can reinvent this institution, entire the entire first branch of government, which is the legislature, but think about it. Congress um, is the best real estate in our democracy, the first branch is. It already exists in an evolved way. It's just not modernized and it's just not adapted to what we need today to have a democratic republic. I think it's entirely possible. It already exists in other countries and in other sectors of our economy. And I hope we get to talk about that. Thank you for having me. I, I trust that we will and you'll make sure that we do. Uh, we want to come back to that question of reinvention and also to this question of the impediments to that reinvention uh, in the absence of broadband, in the absence of infrastructure, what are the things we need to change. But let me first come to Daniel, policy director at Demand Progress. Uh, we hear this teed up, and I'm playing into this, unfortunately, as this constant antinomy between this choice between remote Congress and no Congress. Um, and the, why is that a legitimate conflict? And is that a correct characterization of it's all or nothing in some way? Um, and I'm curious where you think that rhetoric is coming from and if it's right. Yeah, so uh, in, certainly in the short term, I think that that's right. I mean, there's there's basically three camps. You know, there's the camp of we can do everything the way it was, and you don't need to change anything. We, you know, we're just going to pretend like it's January instead of May. There's the second camp, which is like, well, things may have changed a little bit, so we'll have these hybrid hearings, you know, and we'll play around a little bit at the edges, but ultimately we're going to still bring a lot of people back. Uh, and you know, camp number one and camp number two, you know, they're not taking into account the reality that. Uh, the nature of the pandemic is that when you're physically co-located with other people, that's how people get sick. That's how the physician, you know, the capital police get sick. That's how the flight attendants get sick. That's how the custodians get sick. That is a bad approach. And since we don't know what's going to happen, it's a failure to plan ahead for what happens if this lasts another three months, another six months, another year. So the third option, the final option, which is where most people have landed, is a remote Congress. And that is not a unitary term and encompasses multitude. So it can mean maybe you have discussions that are over video conference, or maybe you do proxy voting. And there's like all sorts of inside the beltway jargon that I will try to avoid as much as I humanly can. Um, but there's a lot of options there. And the trouble with that approach is it comes down to the trouble with anything which is commerce, which is that's about power. Who has it, who doesn't have it, and how does it change? And that's ultimately what the debate is about now. Is, is, is it going to go more to leadership or to the rank and file or to committees? Is it going to change between the House and the Senate or, or between Congress and the executive branch? That is the fundamental question that we're facing. And when it comes to questions of power, members of Congress become very, very interested. Uh, and that is what's driving a lot of the animosity. And the questions of power then drive the questions of politics, which is the rhetoric around well, you know, emergency workers need to go back to work, so why doesn't Congress? Not taking into account, of course, that the best advice that we all have is that you work from home to the extent you can. So that's the that's the debate in a nutshell. And there's a lot more that I'm looking forward to unpacking. Maybe quick jargon check for folks, since it's been mentioned a few times, is does someone just want to explain what is proxy voting? Sure, I can do it. Uh, uh, proxy voting is when you ask somebody else to vote for you. You, it can either be general terms. So I can say, you know, Beth, you know my best interests. You can vote on my behalf and on any matter that comes before you. That's like one form of proxy voting. But the form that we're talking about here, it tends to be much more narrow, which is this bill HR 1234 is about to come up. And when it comes up, I want you to vote yes for me. And you can't do anything else, but all you can do is vote yes. I can't be there. So you're going to vote for me. Uh, and that's the, that's the other end of that spectrum. What it also means is that in that context, if something changes, or if we want to have a conversation uh, with other members, like those things can't happen because it's a proxy. You're not present. You're telling someone else to do something for you, which means you're taking yourself out of the equation, except for the purposes of voting. 
interesting. There has been a lot of discussion of proxy voting in many contexts, as in for those people on the chat who are real democracy watchers, I think this idea of proxy voting has been considered in a variety of contexts more with citizens as a new form of representative democracy. So I want to come back to kind of uh, the, your, your views on this. But I want to bring Marcy into the conversation first and pick up where Daniel left off on this issue of power. Um, why, in your view, and given your extensive experience uh, in, on the Hill and then as an observer of the Hill and working with the Hill, um, what's your thought as to the primary reasons why people are so reluctant to go online or to adopt these innovations? Why are we five, six weeks into this, three months in, I've lost track, whatever it is now, uh, amount of time we've been into this. Why are people so reluctant? Is it an issue of power or is it something else? I, I mean, I think it's it's several things. I think it's about, I, I, would, I would break it into about three different things. So I think initially, uh, some of the, the reticence actually just came from, from a, a human reaction of not being able to imagine that we were actually in as grave a situation as we are in. So even the, the failure to imagine that this was going to be a state of affairs that needed a plan that, would, that might last months. I, I think when we initially started having this conversation, there were many members of Congress who thought that this was a you know few weeks, five six weeks at the most problem. We can all, we can recess, we can come back, we can figure it out. This is not something we need to change precedent for. Uh, I think that potentially is is changing somewhat, and I, and I think then the concern became uh, technical and cultural. So. Uh, the technical question is one that those of us who use this technology all the time already knew that it was possible, that it wasn't a big deal, that there were plenty of vendors, there were plenty of ways to do it, uh, but, but we're not Congress and we're not the staffers. So in a lot of cases, the, the reticence you hear is actually less from the members and more from the staffers that need to be between the members and the technology. And their job is to make sure that the, the member of Congress doesn't look stupid, doesn't say something they're not supposed to say, doesn't press a button they're not supposed to press. And so the just the, the cultural dynamics of, of the comfort that members have knowing how they sit in a hearing, what they do in a hearing, versus all of the unknowns that present themselves for uh, a, a virtual proceeding that's real. It's not something that anybody is going to tell you out loud for the most part, but it, but it is very visceral and exists both for the members and for the staffers. Um, and then I think the third, and, and I think we're, we're gradually getting through those first two issues. There's a realization this, this is real and it's going to last. There's more comfort with the technology. There's even uh, greater comfort on the part of the staff that, uh, that they can work through their, their own nervousness. But then the third piece is what Daniel mentioned, and that's the power dynamics. And I, I think that is where, uh, again, for the current state of affairs, for a, a traditional, so Daniel's very helpfully come up with the terms for uh, uh, identifying what is virtual, what is remote, what is traditional. So now we say traditional hearing instead of just hearing, and that actually means everybody's sitting in the same room. Uh, but for a traditional hearing, even though the dynamics are not something that the minority loves, they know how to deal with the rules that they have, the tools that they have. And I think there's, there's great concern on, on the part of the minority, so the Republicans in the House, and in some cases the Democrats in the Senate, that they won't be able to uh, exercise their prerogatives in the same way on a virtual hearing. So some of the concerns that we have as we're talking to members is who controls the mic? What if I want to seek recognition? Uh, what, you know, how, where is the camera? Will people be able to see me if I'm raising my hand and the chair isn't recognizing me? So interesting power dynamics that, again, may not be ideal in a traditional setting, but they're known. And so uh, a new technology introduces many unknowns. And I think right now that that is the, the stage that we've reached as far as the nervousness for uh, new processes. So maybe just a quick, uh, so first a reminder to everybody and thank you to Ellen for getting us started with some questions in the Q&A. Please keep them coming and we'll moderate them in just a second. Um, maybe just it would be worth a quick digression, Marcy, for you and anyone else to tell folks about some of the steps you've taken to help people at least overcome that cultural reticence uh, and to get them used to working online. If you wouldn't mind, just spend 30 seconds on, on the timeline that has led up to, frankly, now actually doing real work online, but that didn't seem possible a few weeks ago. 
Sure. So uh, some of some of this conversation began a, a bit with people on this call, uh, kind of coming to the same conclusions around the same time that that the, the the wave was coming and that Congress probably did not know how it was going to handle it. So uh, the folks on this call sent a letter with principles that that Congress should keep in mind, including, as Daniel mentioned, a kind of digital first approach that if something can be done digitally, it should be done digitally. Uh, I'm happy to say that steps have been taken in that direction, including the House changing its rules to allow for the digital submission of new bills, of co-sponsorships, of uh, remarks for the record. Uh, and then, uh, again, the folks in this group, including you, Beth, we, we uh, pulled together uh, some members of civil society, former members uh, and, and former staffers to actually role play uh, a mock hearing and uh, to, to basically go through the movements and show how it might work in, in reality. The, the reason for that being, as all of us know who work with technology, you can never possibly game out all of the issues you're going to hit when you try a new technology, even if you think you've imagined every scenario. The only way to actually test it is to do it. And again, back to the risk tolerance of members and staffers, they, they are in most cases, not the ones who should be doing those tests and hitting those bumps, especially in the zero sum world of Congress where one person's mistake is another person's campaign ad. So they have a much uh, lower risk tolerance than the rest of us. So our approach and, and thankfully Brian extended the invitation to participate to the former members of Congress Association. So we had over 60 members, former members of Congress join us uh, to run mock hearings and test out how technology could be used to, to run remote proceedings. So uh, the, over to you, Brian, then I was just about to, I'm glad that Marcy took your name in vain so that we can uh, hand the mic to you for a second. You have both as a result of that uh, mock and many events before and since, have talked to a lot of former and current members uh, picking up on sort of Daniel and Marcy's point, what's your view as to what is the primary source of the reluctance of people to go online uh, uh, from your perspective? Well, Marcy and Daniel laid it out really well. Uh, there's a, there's a, an understandable desire to stick with tradition. Uh, some members of Congress are not particularly tech savvy and there's a concern that they may not be able to, to manage the technology. There's also a certain political dynamic that I think we have to address that's, that's kind of dangerous in two ways. One, there may be a desire for leadership on both sides to want control, which is perhaps understandable, but it's antithetical to a true republic. And it's an intriguing thing that both Leader Pelosi and Mitch McConnell, or Speaker Pelosi and Mitch McConnell, who hardly ever agree on anything, at least for a time, agreed that there wouldn't be remote uh, meetings and action by Congress. That seems to be changing a little bit. But now there's also a political dynamic of some who are saying, oh, we have to go right back in and be courageous, et cetera. Ironically, they're pointing to doctors and nurses and saying they have to work. Well, doctors and nurses would be the first to say that the last thing you want to do is con con uh, convene in a tight place where you can spread the disease. So the doctors and nurses are going to have to treat you in their hospitals. What we really should do is what we're doing here right now. And that is allow members to interact. What members have told me is it's incredibly frustrating to see legislation handed down kind of ex cathedra from above, and you're only given a chance to vote yay or nay. And as Daniel pointed out, proxy voting is not at all like the real thing. And a real vote, when you come to the floor, sometimes your mind is made up, but sometimes it could go either way. And you have a chance then to see how the vote is going, to see how your colleagues are voting, and maybe your mind changes along the way through discussion. Proxy voting does not allow that. And of course, if you can't even vote and you can't even meet, that's all even, even more uh, uh, meaningless. So there's, there are legitimate reasons about concerns about how can we convene? How do we recognize minority rights, et cetera? But there are also a lot of illegitimate uh, and, and obfuscatory uh, 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 arguments. Maybe I could push you and then anyone else who wants to jump in for a moment on the political questions on the kind of partisan issues here. Who, <laughs> uh, um, I, could flame, what's, I'm, I can flame this in the most inflammatory way possible, but I'll be, I'll, I, will, uh, I, I won't do that. We've seen both sides, as you said, kind of hurling epithets at one another. Norm Ornstein has a piece today in the USA Today entitled Republicans are hobbling Congress amid the coronavirus so Trump can keep abusing power. 
Um, but at the same time, then you have Kevin McCarthy saying in a headline today, this is the biggest power grab in history by the Democrats. Who's right and who's wrong in this? And how do the partisan politics play into this? Well, if we focus on, on whether or not there'll be proxy voting, I think that does tend to disempower uh, members, particularly as somebody who lives on the West Coast. This idea that, that, that the East Coasters who are close and don't have to fly across the country and enclose airplanes are going to somehow represent those of us on the West Coast is, is really un, untenable for me. But the, the sad part is I have a way right now to do just exactly what we're doing, where I could talk to colleagues, I could cast an informed real-time vote, everybody in the public could make sure it's me who's doing the vote, and we could change and adapt and, and offer input as normal. That technology exists, as, as you know better than anybody, perhaps, Beth, uh, Brazil is doing it, Spain is doing it, the United Kingdom is doing it, people around the world are showing us the way and we're refusing to follow. That is, uh, to some extent, a plague on the leadership of both uh, parties because they really should get with the program, enable their members to represent the public and have real debate and real meaningful real-time votes. Does anybody else want to jump in on that? To say that um, the consolidation of power to the top in Congress has been happening for decades at this point. And so it was almost sort of an easy sleepwalk into this, uh, this uh, real uh, top-down hierarchical, anti-democratic, to be honest. Members of Congress in their rank and file, I mean, you saw it with the diminishment of the committee process and the fact that committees meet maybe 50% of the time and that they hardly, you know, they're not even really doing conference bills anymore where they all the chambers get together and the only bills that have consistently passed over the last 10 to 15 years have been the defense bills this is a really unhealthy signal already and so this consolidation of power to the top um, and trying to run the house especially like some kind of parliamentary system it's one of the reasons it has stopped working because it, in the DNA of Congress is representation. It has to represent, especially on the House side. And, and our failure to adapt and modernize and create a way for you know, participatory voice, not only for the members, but for Americans, is one of the reasons I think we've seen such a disconnect. Um, but yeah, like this, this is, a, I like to say this is not an accident, it's an outcome. A lot of things were moving in this direction already. And then you have these sort of personalities on the top who are really used to uh, power as approximate idea, meaning proximity to power and everything's just half a mile away. Um, you know, and they're both what, 80 or almost, that says a lot right there. And um, my dad was an early adapter and better than I am on beta testing every technology, but you really cannot make that assumption in Congress, especially in the leadership, when it doesn't serve their operating style to begin with. So is that I, fair? I mean, other people chime in. Is that fair? <laughs> I, I do want to just sort of, it might, in, in, in Beth coming off if it's, if it's too verbose, but um, so I think it's important to think about like the incentives because people, people, the different players have their incentives. So Pelosi and McConnell, as, as Brian mentioned, initially they opposed any type of proxy voting in their chambers because they were, or any type of remote voting because they were afraid that it would weaken their power. So one of the regular tools that leadership uses to force you to vote for something you wouldn't want to vote for is they do it right before the day of the recess when, you, when you're going to go home and it's Christmas or it's Thanksgiving and you got to vote for this final thing before you, before you leave. And it forces the members to vote for something they wouldn't necessarily want to vote for otherwise because there won't be another opportunity. And the leadership was afraid of losing that and many, many other levers, like twisting your arm when you're on the floor. So initially, Pelosi and McConnell were against it. Um, but the decision, uh, particularly in the House, meant that you no longer had the House of Representatives acting in opposition to the executive branch. So while this was preserving Pelosi's power vis-a-vis -vis the rank and file, it was undermining her power against Trump, which meant that a lot of the bills that went through did not reflect Democratic interests very much because she had taken the House of Representatives out of the game. And the rank and file members and some of the leadership in the committee chairs started to revolt. And they said, no, 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 we have to be able to function. We have to be able to work. And this moved Pelosi from saying, no, 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 no. Like she was saying, it's unconstitutional, it's impossible, like all these reasons, 
And now she's saying, well, yes, in certain ways, we're going to do this to protect her power. On the Senate side, and this is, again, this is my view, like McConnell is not interested in legislating at all. He doesn't really care about that. But what he cares about are judges. So to move judges, um, you, he's bringing the Senate back to vote on judges. Um, he can't do remote voting that easily because to change the Senate rules isn't majoritarian, requires 67, requires Democrats to agree. Democrats may try to, you know, to get their pound of flesh in return for allowing judges to go through. So McConnell's calculus is, I'm going to keep bringing them back so I can keep pushing through these judges. And it also allows me to align politically and rhetorically with the president who's making all these arguments about like returning and working in person. So that's why we're seeing the split is because of the incentives for the different players in terms of whether they come back and how they come back. Oh, there's so much to probe on this question, but I want to uh, uh, bring in a couple of additional points and, and open this up very soon to questions. So please put the questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, if you don't mind, uh, would be wonderful. Um, so besides the, so there are all of these power arguments and these political arguments, but in addition to them, and maybe that's the end of the discussion, but there have been some very real concerns voiced about the notion that um, this will, you know, there's a tradition to uphold. And if we move online or change the way things work, that Congress will become a museum. Or conversely, we've heard the comment that uh, this will erode civility in Congress if we're meeting on, on Zoom, it's less time spent in Washington and we will see even less deliberation. So either of those two, um, do you put much stock in those arguments and, and, and the people who are making them? Uh, and, and maybe um, uh, let me go over to Marcy and then anyone else who wants to take it. Well, I, I think that the people making those arguments are very sincere. And I think that there's, uh, there's a longstanding discussion among uh, people who want, to, want Congress to work better who believe that more opportunity for members of Congress to get to know each other, to spend time together, will open opportunities for more negotiation, better bipartisanship, and reaching across the aisle and just a general sense of common humanity. Uh, so I, I think that those arguments are, are uh, genuine and, and I think uh, legitimate in, in many cases. I uh, personally don't think that allowing Congress to continue to function in the midst of a pandemic where their safety is threatened if they return to actually be in person and even if they're in person they have to stay six feet away from each other actually uh, implicates those concerns. I'm, I am I think that it's it's important to continue to pursue ways especially on the other side of the pandemic for members to spend time together. I think that CODELs and opportunities for them to travel together and to learn together and to uh, get to know each other are very important. But, but right now, uh, the, the, the question is, can Congress continue to operate to the, to the point that, that uh, Brian was making at the beginning of the discussion? And how can that happen in a modern and appropriate way that reflects the same kinds of adjustments that people all over the country are making to just deal with this very strange uh, situation that we're all living through. So I, I don't think that the concerns are uh, uh, disingenuous, but I, I don't think that they are what should be holding us up now. You know, Beth, you use the term turn Congress into a museum. The concern right now is the COVID is going to turn it into a mausoleum. Uh, if, if we have members getting sick and dying or staff members getting sick and dying unnecessarily, that's going to disrupt, could it disrupt the balance of power in the Congress? And then people's attention would be grasped. You know, I mean, it's been very hard since September 11th. Many of us have worked to try to say Congress should prepare for catastrophic disasters, including pandemics, but even worse attacks. And Congress has sadly been largely unwilling to do this. But the fact is, the more important you are, the more essential it is for you to be replaceable. And Congress has not made itself either able to function or be replaceable in time of crisis. And what's happening right now is, if you know, just ask, we had this hearing with, as Marcy mentioned, more than 50 members of Congress. We had General David Petraeus, who described how he was able to lead the effort in Iraq, Afghanistan, and it's the CIA head, and now in the corporate world, remotely. We had members of the British Parliament and the Spanish government saying they're doing this remotely. And you just ask yourself this question. If, if, if you had a loved one far away 
and they were sick or they needed you, would you rather not be able to talk to them at all or do it remotely? Obviously, if you could be there and hold their hand and hug them, terrific, you'd do it. But at the very least, you would do this. And Congress is capable of doing that. And really, I wanna stress this. Marcy's right. Some of the concerns are sincere, but they're not necessarily based on evidence or experience. When we had that meeting, and when I've talked to members of Congress who've been involved with remote sort of de facto hearings, they almost all say, you know what? It went pretty well. We were able to ask questions. We were able to exchange information. I could look at my colleagues. I could offer input. Most people find that it, it's not as good as the real thing. No one's saying it should replace the real thing, but temporarily in a time of crisis, it sure beats nothing. Well, and, and I'd just like to build on that, the point that Brian just made, which is it kind of back to the question about how Congress adopts technology and, and its risk tolerance. It is very rare for Congress to pilot anything to, so you, you frequently have discussions about congressional process and procedure that really are based on uh, uh, you know, observational studies or opinions about what happened 50 and 100 and 200 years ago. And rarely are there actually opportunities to see what would happen if you tried X or Y. And what this pandemic creates is actually a great impetus to try something different on a temporary basis. I think what's something that should be emphasized is that all of the reforms that are being suggested are all for a temporary change solely during the emergency and that things would go back to the way that they were before, at least by default. But I am, I am very optimistic that we will learn things during this time that can improve congressional operations and potentially even relations uh, in the future. I'd love to, if I can just underscore something that Marcy's saying. Um, yes, before you jump in, Daniel, I just wanna let Daniel and Samantha know that as soon as you finish, I'm gonna unmute them and have them ask their questions. Okay, great. So, um, Congress often takes the view or, or leadership does that nothing is ever done for the first time. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, it usually requires um, some sort of an emergency before they will change their operations in a significant way, but there are regular changes that happen all the time. Uh, and the choice that we have here is not between like going back to some sort of idealized version of congressional operations that we had on January 21st or whatever it was this year. It's members not being able to talk to each other closely. It's being dangerous to go to rooms. It's the public isn't present. It's that staff aren't largely available. You know, there isn't an option to go backward. We're at a fork in the road and there is a decision that needs to be made. And the decision is what path do you wanna take going forward, knowing that you can't go back to the way things were and realizing that Congress is a living institution and it does evolve both its norms and its procedures over time. So it isn't like we're overturning 230 years of precedent, but rather there's like changes in these things that have happened gradually over time as driven by external events. So the first set of arguments about, well, we've never done this before. I mean, that's, of, of all the arguments that someone can make, that's a really weak one in the legislative context. The question should more be, what do we need to do to best, best serve as legislators to best fulfill our role in the federal government? And that is the question that they should be asking themselves. And that and I think is the, the proper place to be focused. Maybe I could invite Samantha and Daniel to ask your questions, to unmute and ask your question. We'll take two questions and then let whoever wants to respond. Maybe giving a preference to Lorelai who hasn't spoken yet in a while. Samantha? Sure, you just want me to repeat it out loud? Uh, sure here, or you're the, yeah, start, go ahead. Yeah, um, so Marcy and Daniel and Lorelai know me quite well. And I've been thinking a lot this week about playing more of the devil advocate role um, and thinking about technology and how it often amplifies centralized authorities when people in those powers tend to use it for their own interests. And I'm wondering if we do move to this remote setting, which it looks like we're going to, which is great, what do we need to start thinking about now in terms of the tech standards that need to be put in place? How would someone like Mitch McConnell or Nancy Pelosi maybe use this technology to their advantage to maintain centralized authority? And maybe what would that look like? Great, and Daniel, and loving the clock, I like it, nifty. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, segwaying what, what Samantha just asked, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, in, in you guys helping us understand how a move to remote hearings or other ways of, of uh, remote deliberation could change the power dynamics within Congress. Um, 
in, in some instances, you know, groups can, can stand to gain as, as Samantha was mentioning, but there's also scenarios or tools in which uh, tweaks could, could to current procedures could actually amplify the, the voice of minorities or other ways in which um, uh, power could be upended. So, so please elaborate on that. Who'd like to take that? Laura, I'll, uh, I'll uh, give it a try. So I think that um, you know our our uh, fate as our first branch of government is going to be determined by what happens really in the next maybe two to six months, and that it depends on who's the first movers in this new space. Um, there's a huge opportunity right now to build out deliberative infrastructure at the local district level. There's not a lot of attention that's being paid to district offices and district staff who are indeed the people interacting with the population. Um, there are 900 district offices in the United States. That's a, a tr pretty tremendous um, decentralized distributed network. There are all kinds of, of places that could be co-sponsoring or providing events for members just to socialize them with using technology. Part of the problem in Congress for uh, video conferencing is the real locked in vendor system. Right now, sort of Cisco and WebEx are the ones that Congress is going with. Cisco needs to hear from us to build out many, many different participatory models, ones with sort of subtle regional different uh, uh, configurations for mod content moderation, for rules of engagement. But I think that you know, civil society has just got a huge role here. The people who care about the public good and, and collaborative collective outcomes, we, we need to get in this space. So anybody who's watching this, I would argue is contact the local office and ask, how can you help them on um, creating new mechanisms for uh, participatory, deliberative, democratic participation on policy? We worked on this, I did 18 months of field research over the last two years. And you would be amazed at how every member uh, district that I went to, they were figuring out new ways to curate the crowd, to manage the process. Um, and uh, for the most part, it was all within the existing rules of Congress. So Congress is, is very indirect in a lot of ways and the members need to have a political constituency to move forward. And this is one of those things that they need is they need local partners in the community maker spaces, uh, technology companies um, who can create sort of mimics, procedural mimics or surrogate platforms, things like that. So they just get used to the idea of doing what we're doing right here. Because at some point Congress will have to uh, create a diverse menu of options for connecting to citizens. And, and, and you know, in my view, they should consider it critical infrastructure. Like what we're going through right now should have never happened in the first place. And so now is our chance to say, you know, we'll be ready. This was a warning shot, but we need to build this out to the periphery um, because everyone needs to be able to participate in this next iteration of our democracy. If I can just add two points too, to what Laurel is saying, I think uh, to Daniel's question about how a, a rebalance might open up to, to new voices, which I think is what Laurel I was mentioning. One of the things that virtual technology definitely does is opens the opportunity for witnesses that can't hop on a plane and pay for their own way to go to Washington to be there during the hour uh, when the hearings are occurring. So it, one of the interesting things that happened in the mock is we heard from international legislators, which has never happened in a hearing in Congress because they don't currently take testimony virtually. So even just the opportunity to hear from people on the front lines. Uh, to, to hear from diverse folks who can't make it to Washington, that, that would change hearings uh, in Congress. And to Samantha's point uh, about uh, questions that need to be asked now, I think that that is a really important point because I think we're beyond the question of should this happen and now we're to the process question of how this should happen. And so questions about, for example, do members, my, do members retain control of their own mic? So just like in a traditional hearing, they can interrupt and say, Mr. Chairman, I seek recognition. That's important. Even these, these uh, kind of really in, in the weeds questions that are coming up about what does the screen display? Does it show a Brady Bunch view or does it show the individual speaker? Those questions may sound small, but to I think uh, folks who are trying to figure out what the power dynamics are going to be in a hearing, they're really important. And so those are the kinds of questions that people should be addressing now, not the should we or shouldn't we do this at all. Yeah, and can I add just one little quick point on top of that? Um, and it's, it's not just the rules, but it's also the norms. So it's things like, 
I'm in this particular hearing, you know, all members are given five minutes to ask questions, but the chairman always gives people a little bit more time. And what happens if you go to being remote? Are they gonna cut me off at five minutes or gonna treat me unequally? Or are they going to continue to make sure that I have the chance to finish my thought and not cut me off in mid sentence? And there's a lot of other behaviors that go along with this. There's votes that members take that aren't recorded you know, where you let something that you don't, that's politically unpalatable go by, you know, that you agree with, but it's politically unpalatable, go by without having your vote recorded so you can have good things happen without, you know, being subject to the negative, con ne negative consequences. And there's all sorts of these behaviors and workarounds that aren't in the rules. And if you've got a good chair and a, like a lot of goodwill, you can keep doing this in a remote setting. But the nature of Congress over the last couple of decades, at least, is that there isn't an excess of goodwill and that some places you trust your colleagues and in some places you don't. Um, and uh, nowhere are these relationships more fraught than leadership to members and between the chambers. Uh, and that is something that, um, you know, like one of the questions was like, how do you deal with them? What can you anticipate? It really depends on the nature of the people who are running the hearings and the meetings and the committees and the floor, if they are institutionalists or if they're just sort of out for their own power. And if they're out for their own power, they need to be checked. If they're more about like comedy and like working together, then like there's more leeway. And we're seeing that like fighting, like that, that that's like, that's the grist for them. Like that's the stuff that's making a lot of people uncomfortable is but how do these, unwritten ways of normal behavior get changed uh, through these processes. And what can you do to make sure that, you know, when you do this in an entirely different way, you still have the ability to, to work together in a way that's productive. And that's, and that's really hard. Brian, last word to you. Yeah, a couple quick things. First, those who are concerned about the concentration of power in majority, it's not just majority, it's in leadership versus in the representative body. And there's few things that concentrate power more than the absence of the representatives themselves. If we're not in town, either remotely or in person, then leadership gets to run the show without your representative being there to have a voice. Remote Congress allows you to at least have a voice until you can be there in person. Secondly, it's, it, Daniel's exactly right, and so is Marcy it, 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 and Lorelai. Look, it's not just about the rules. We do need structures in place that allow the minority to have a voice, but there's always a balance. If a, if a minority in the Congress wants to disrupt the regular proceedings, they can do that in real time by shouting in a hearing, by, by a whole host of other things. They can also do it uh, online. So there needs to be a balance. And the real key to the balance is, are we as representatives here to score political points, to grandstand, or are we here to learn, to work together, to solve problems? You can't exactly write that into the rules but it's fundamental to the culture. People sometimes say, gee, if we're not there in person, we're not gonna have civility. Civility doesn't always derive from being together in person or we'd have plenty of civility before COVID-19 and we did not. People distance themselves in part because of incivility. What we need to do is find ways to unite as we did after September 11th, at least for a while, and find ways to work together. Technology can actually enable that. And that's the last point I wanna make. If you can communicate with one another as we are here, and if you have respectable, responsible people who want to work together, you can make technology actually empower the minority, improve the process, and increase the representational value for the constituents who we are supposed to be there to serve. So I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna uh, unmute three people and I, we're gonna use the clock. So just to Yanis, who I know has a million questions, if some of the panel could try to answer some online, Yanis, I'll ask you to be brief in your questions, but let's do Jonathan first, Irene, nice to see you. And then Yanis uh, uh, rounding out and then we'll take answers. Yes, uh, my question, thanks Beth, is uh, the balance of power between the federal government and the states. I'm actually from Canada, parliamentary system. And what we've seen up here over the last uh, several decades is a centralization of power under the uh, prime minister's office or the premier's offices for the states. And that's at the expense of local uh, municipal and district governments. So my question is, how do you think the uh, digital first strategy will affect that dynamic? Irene? Hi, thanks Hi. everyone. 
Uh, so I'm from, I'm talking to you from Mexico and here we are seeing that Congress is just using like webinars to make a facade that they are actually doing open government, uh, but they are not actually taking into account what it's being said in this webinar. So my question to you is how to avoid that the incorporation of technology in the, in the work of Congress is just being used as a facade uh, or like a, a, a trying to make proof that they're being open uh, with the Congress when they are actually not taking into account what is being discussed in these webinars. And Yanis, if you could pick one of your questions. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, uh, the, the, the technology aspect of it is uh, what concerns me. Uh, the technology is handled now by private companies. Uh, and I don't know if we can trust them in both administering, but also securing the confidentiality of the record and of the of the communications and the corollary to that is with behavioral of the congressman will they be more candid knowing that they're being constantly recorded thank you thank you let's see who wants to answer what and i'll ask you to give brief answers and i have to say i love the filibuster question so i hope somebody answers that one what a zoom filibuster looks like but go ahead who wants to take which one of those i can start if you want um, please uh, so, uh, for, so Irene's question was about open washing, uh, which is where you have fake uh, transparency. I think that is often a problem. And the check on that is usually the opposing parties. At least what we've seen in the US context is that over time, the parties will compete often on transparency measures. And as they go back and forth and assume power from one to the other, that often acts as a ratchet for certain transparency mechanisms. That's not always true, of course. Uh, it certainly didn't work on the executive level um, with the Trump administration going backward, but at least in the legislative, in the House, we've seen that competition three or four times going back and forth. Uh, to Jonathan's question on federalism, I don't, I, don't, it, it, I don't think that the technology changes the balance of power between the states and the federal government. I think that in the American context, it, changes the it can change the balance between the executive branch and the legislative branch and the courts. Uh, which is which can have federalism implications. Um, and just to Giannis's question very quickly, for open proceedings, it doesn't matter if people are spying on it, right? Because it's open. Uh, where it's, you know, so the whatever technology you use, you have a check. So if if I hold if we hold the public vote and we do it over Zoom or we do it over some app, you have a checking mechanism. The concerns arise more in the context of closed proceedings. Um, and our federal government has spent tons and tons of money on its security establishment to have secure mechanisms to uh, have uh, for, for folks be able to chat with one another uh, in the executive branch context, and that could be used in the legislative branch context, context as well. So that was three. I know it was a lot. I'll stop so others can, can talk. Yeah, I would just, just oh, oh, I would go ahead, Lorelai. I was just going to say again is I feel like Congress should examine and inventory its own first branch properties. You know, federal depository libraries exist everywhere. Um, why can't we invent something um, like a civic skiff or, or a, that's a confidential area for intelligence committee where you can go in and information is protected. I feel like we need to be creative and also empower the first branch because the last thing we want to do with this digital transformation is to seed even more power of information and technology and capacity to the executive branch. So that's all I'd say is that I think we can do it within Congress's own authorities and capacities and that we need to just be creative and imagine what that would look like. So there's a, there, there are a couple of questions about uh, closed meetings and, and, and things like that. I just wanna say that right now, we are actually existing in kind of the worst of all worlds, which is that virtual meetings are happening just because they're not official proceedings. They are not required to have the same notice uh, and, and to be open and, and, and broadcast as, as they happen. So that's why it's so important that, that these steps are taken to allow official or to allow hearings to be official hearings rather than just having these closed roundtables that are that are really happening. Uh, quite frequently now. So once once rules are changed to make these virtual proceedings official proceedings of the committees, then you have the the rules of of openness and notice that that will apply. I think it's important to jump in and say that look, it's very possible to to not only imagine but observe how this technology is actually making it more accessible uh, uh, to 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 a diversified public. You know, 
uh, Marcy pointed out earlier that that we can now have witnesses from our local communities who might previously have had to fly back. Just this week, uh, many of us listened in for almost the first time in history to the Supreme Court in real time having its its uh, its arguments, its oral arguments. In, in the past, you could get them, but it was a week later. As many of you know, average committees, the day-to-day -day committees are almost never covered by C-SPAN because it has limited bandwidth and resources. And so this technology could allow every single committee hearing to on whatever the subject, it may be small relative to the big picture, but to somebody it may be vital. We can now broadcast simultaneously all the hearings so anybody anywhere on earth could watch them with the exception of the classified uh, hearings or of, of perhaps uh, conference committees. So we can actually use this technology to be more democratizing and, uh, and more representative in some really creative ways that, that might benefit and reduce concentration of power. So in the interest of time, since it's two minutes before the hour, I want to, uh, first of all, thank everybody for this lively discussion. Uh, and I want to move towards wrapping it up. Um, there is a question from Adriana in the Q&A that Marcy, I think you might be able to answer directly there because that's a link that we can provide people with. And I would just point you to the other questions in either the chat or the Q&A if anybody wants to uh, run a parallel sidebar to this. But while you're doing that and sort of wrapping up some of the discussion, and I will invite people, of course, to continue to stay on and mingle and drink a virtual glass of wine after six o'clock, nobody has to leave then. Um, but I do want to ask you guys, and you have raised some of this, is just to do a quick go around and say, what are the one thing that we absolutely need to do in order to ensure that this process, this movement toward innovation uh, moves forward and also sticks and that we don't go backwards as soon as we start to reopen the economy and the pandemic. Uh, how do we actually inculcate the kind of innovation we have seen in places, as Brian mentioned, like Brazil, uh, like Ecuador, like Chile, now in the UK, um, uh, as in Spain, where they have actually built infrastructure uh, and been doing things in new ways, both proxy voting and online voting. What do you want to see happen? Give us your kind of final roundup uh, 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 very quickly all, all the way around. Well, right. I'm going to say Barcy. something. Oh, Barcy. excuse me. That's okay. Barcy, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I'm going to say something a little crazy, which is just catch them doing something right. Because right now for members of Congress to go be the first one to hold a proceeding, you know, it's not time to make fun of someone's dog barking or to talk about like it is really impressive that this 200 plus year old institution is doing this and there will be bumps we've all had our own bumps in our technology uh, uh, experiments over the past several months it's it's really important that congress is doing this and and it really is a zero-sum world it is all too easy for someone to uh, capitalize on various errors that are going to happen, but a, a Congress with technical difficulties adjusting to new technology is a Congress at work and we need to see more of it, not less. Marcy said it beautifully, there are people, the former members participated, a number of leaders in the House and the Senate on both sides of the aisle are actually trying to make this work and we need to support that. The other thing we must keep in mind is it, that underlying all of this are fundamental vulnerabilities to continuity writ large. COVID, as bad as it is, September 11th, as bad as it was, really could be far, far worse. We could be losing hundreds uh, of members in real time, a nuclear attack or a really serious and massively deadly and contagious pandemic could disable and change the balance of power. All three branches of government have significant flaws in their, or no, a uh, viable continuity mechanism at all. A commission called the Continuity of Government Commission has published three volumes of this. Post September 11th, there was an effort to fix it. It is still not fixed. The United States of America, all three branches of government remain terribly vulnerable and that has to get fixed. Technology is possibly a part of that fix, but we really need to do it and not uh, uh, walk away from it once again as we did post September 11th. Daniel? So I, I would say the question is how to keep it going. So I think that there's three things that are necessary to keep it going. One is that we have fundamentally underinvested in our legislative branch. I say underinvested, like we've cut funding for Congress significantly. If you want to have technology that works, if you want to have people that are able to do the jobs, you have to pay for it. You get what you pay for. The second is we need to build institutions inside the legislative branch 
that uh, talk to each other, that coordinate with each other. The amount of siloing is significant. There have been efforts to address this, but there needs to be the ability to have the different players on the nonpartisan level and some of the partisans working together on this. And the final thing that's missing is political will. Leadership, when they want modernization to happen, it happens. When they don't want it to happen, it doesn't happen. And there are people inside the institution who have been like Steny Hoyer, for example, and Scalise, you know, McCart, like they, they've wanted to see innovation happen and they've made it a priority. Uh, but when you have people who are in charge who don't want it to happen, uh, they starve the institution and they make sure that these cross-cutting institutions, that these cross-cutting um, entities can't be built. And that's what we're seeing. So if you want it to work, do those three things and we will see the legislative branch continue to innovate. Lorelai, did you get a last word in? Sure. Yeah, no, I would just uh, double down on what everybody just said is that a member of Congress needs a viable political constituency to have his or her back, especially when they're doing something new and different. And there's a way to incentivize this change. Um, if there's anybody in civil society or philanthropy that's listening to this, ask your membership to be that group of local people that helps this member of Congress take a stand on this, uh, have a proof of concept, talk to them about the need. If you go to the continuityofcongress.org that Daniel put up, um, look at the letters and the members who signed those letters already reward them for that, help them take the next step. Um, that's what they're going to they're gonna need. And a lot of it's going to need to happen at the district level because that will give them confidence um, to tip the balance. And we're going to get to a tipping point and we need it to, to be a strong one that has support. Thank you to everybody. And thank you again to IPK and to the Bradamus Center and to all of your organizations for giving of your time for us to be here today. What I wanted to do is invite anybody who wants to uh, to drop off. And for those who would like to mingle with the speakers afterwards, I would suggest we promote everybody to panelists at this point. And if you guys are willing to stay on a couple more minutes for anybody who has any questions that they'd like to ask. So we're gonna turn on the mics for everybody. I'm gonna see how this works. It's an experiment. Uh, um, and does this work by the way, hosts and co-host, Ani and Sam? Does it work to do this? Yes, we're unmuting people. You're unmuting people as we go. Uh, and we'll invite people who want you to drop off. Again, thank you very much for joining us. And um, uh, I should have announced the next event, but I forgot to do that. <laughs> so please, by all means, check. Uh, maybe we can check, uh, follow the GovLab Twitter or IPK NYU for future events like this. Uh, and now for everybody else who's still left, if anybody wants to, um, we can't see the, uh, the way webinar chat looks. We, can't, we can only see, we can't see you individually in the chat. So I would just invite people to unmute if you wanna ask something or to use the Q&A again uh, and we'll see how this works. You, you can ask a question if you have one. I, sorry, I had to move to the shade. <laughs> so I <laughs> walked over. Yes, so in other words, people in the audience who are still here, we have a smaller group now. If anybody wants to ask a question, you should just...